Hey Bottom Pushers, my name is Nick and welcome back to the life and suffering of Sir Bronte. So we're going to jump back to the beginning of peacetime again and I have three things I want to try and do today. I want to try and kill the Court of Honor. I want the rebels to rise up and overtake Anazot because I haven't got that ending in peacetime yet and if we can I want to try and do the full Latari arc. So I think I know how to do all these things. We should be good. I think I need to just ramp up justice as high as it can go. Because when that gets to 10, it will trigger the rise of the rebels. Like the Knight of the Serpents did when Korea was at 10. And Latari, I think I just need to... I need to be equal with Octavia. Because then on a rendezvous with Octavia, I can ask her about her theories which should mean I can then, when she does the transformation, say goodbye, which might then open up another option in the revolt. I don't know. I could be horribly, horribly wrong, but we're going to find out. As always, I'm going to be jumping through a lot of these very quickly, probably even quicker with this one because we've already done the justice path before, but obviously I'll, I'll go through everything and I'll, I'll, give, I'll give cliff notes. But anything different or anything very important, I will go over properly. But if all goes well... This is going to tick off three achievements that we need. So that's good progress. That's on the assumption that I am doing the right thing for the Lotari achievement. I, I honestly don't know if I am or not, but this is the most logical thing I can think of. So with Homecoming, I'm going to speak to Mama because having plus with Mother is a good thing. In terms of reputation and unity, I don't really care about that this playthrough. If it doesn't all crash and burn, that would be lovely. But if it does, it does. I currently have 30 willpower as well, which is a good way to be starting this. First day of work, I am going to go and ask Father for advice. So we spend the day with Father and he kind of brings us up to speed on everything that goes on at the prefecture. So it hurts my career a little bit, but bumps up justice quite nicely. By quite nicely, I mean by one, but you know, it's better than going down. Okay, with the reception at the Bronte residence, I'm going to talk about my victory in the tournament because that's a nice hefty boost to my reputation, which, like I said a minute ago, doesn't matter at all, but it's better than a kick in the teeth. I really hate that expression. Uh, rock and a hard place will defend the Gloria, because that takes the hit on reputation as opposed to the hit on unity, which, again, doesn't really matter, but it's the, the lesser of two evils. So with the land dispute between Sir Elavila and Basil Jung, I'm going to protect Jung's rights, which is what I did on my Justice playthrough, because, you know, it's the legal thing to do. Basil Young has a contract to do as he pleases with the land he's purchased off of El Avila, and El Avila can't just burn down his factory because he doesn't like it. It's the law. Deal with it. So this is going to trigger an event because my career's at two. Yeah. Here we go. Before she blows. So bear in mind I've only ever done one case for the prefecture. I'm already in hot water with everybody. And because I've pissed off practically everyone i'm kind of in a in a stuck position i can't do any work because everyone's scheming against me so i think last time i asked father for help i can annul my decisions or continue the fight i'm not going to annul my decisions because that knocks down my justice uh that knocks down my reputation which i keep saying it like that means anything and it doesn't ah sorry i'm just going to continue the fight because it knocks my career down which boo -hoo. Uh, that increases my valor which i don't need but okay you refuse to give in. You will continue to fight for justice and the rights of the common people. Because yes, I will. And I will make them riot in the streets. And the blood of the nobles will flow. Gotta sound like Sophia. As soon as Folk Raven vanishes behind the door, you put the old cases away in a drawer and get back to work. New lawsuits, litigations, and pleas demand your attention. Your choice was made long ago. You will not give in or compromise with your conscience. Justice must be upheld. If you don't do it, who will? The consequences are not long in coming. An onslaught of complaints and denunciations come crashing down upon you. Notable noblemen demand that Elborn throw you out of the prefecture in disgrace. The prefect comes to your defence, but he will not be able to sustain the pressure for long. The other judges simply avoid you like the plague. Upon meeting you in the hallway, Carlo Folkraven just shakes his head solemnly and keeps walking. You're forced to fight to keep your position. Work feels like a battlefield now, and with each passing day, your enemies close in on you. Soon, they will attack and you will have to make your last stand. Oh. oh, good. I haven't even been recording for 10 minutes and I'm already in danger. When justice hit zero, it triggered basically a mini riot. So 
I wonder what's going to happen when career hits zero. Yeah, with a gift for the family, I am going to give the jewels to prominent nobles as gifts purely because I don't want to piss off Archduke Melanidas and I mean I might not need him to be on a zero but I might need him to be on a zero so I'm not going to risk that so we'll do what we did before give them to nobles which doesn't annoy Archduke Melanidas. The newspaper case so Mayor Egmont has set up a newspaper for the common folk and the noble estate don't like it all too much because it's not that kind about the noble folk so there's been complaints put in and we need to do something about it. So we've been sent to shut it down. Uh, what I did before on the Justice playthrough was legitimize it. And in the career one, seize it. I kind of want to see what happens when career hits zero. So I'm going to not show down the Gazette, as it says. You rule that the Gazette has a legal right to exist and reject the noble's numerous complaints. Why not? Let's continue playing with fire, shall we? You peer over the papers as you write your verdict. The Lesser Quorum's newspaper has not violated any imperial law. You therefore have no choice but to reject the noble's complaints as unfounded. The newspaper's owner, Mayor Egmont, soon hears of your verdict and comes to the prefecture in person. He looks almost like a nobleman. Egmont is well-groomed and wears expensive clothing only a wealthy industrialist could afford. Nevertheless, his rough manner of speaking and boorish posture betray his humble origins. He bows to you ceremoniously. Oh, Your Honour, you have my gratitude for your righteous judgement. I don't know if the nobles are going to stop complaining after this, but now we know the Prefecture is ready to protect the common estate. You warn Egmont against any further careless statements in the newspaper. The next judge may not rule in their favour. Oh, but Your Honour, we write what we think and follow Imperial law to the letter. You receive a note from Magistrate Remy L. Vermin the day after. Bronte, your verdict is an outrage and an affront to the nobility of Margaret. This continued waste of paper on lowborn libel is simply unacceptable. I am very disappointed. Wasting your potential protecting thankless rabble-rousers is no way to advance your career. The Gazette remains in publication, until the Prefecture orders another judge to investigate it after being inundated with complaints from the nobles. The new judge wastes no time banning the paper and fining Egmont for insolence against the nobility. You could have done this to begin with, but you didn't. And as a high society does not forget this. I mean, shut up. Oh, my career's in ruins. <laughs> Invitation to the ball. Oh, I don't think this is going to be a good ball. Your last ruling cost you dearly. The nobility of Anazot demand that you vacate your position as judge. You've made many enemies during your tenure at the prefecture. Prefect Elborn uses all his resources to curb the attacks. It's only by virtue of his protection that you remain a judge, but your career is hanging on by a threat. One misstep and you will lose your position, if not your noble rank. Night is slowly falling upon Anazots. You examine yourself in the mirror, you're dressed in your best doublets, every crease carefully ironed, your sword rests in a luxurious sheath. This night is of the utmost importance. The door to your room opens. Stefan is immaculately dressed as always, but tonight you're on par with him. Looking good, Niklaus. Let's go. Our carriage is waiting. You leave together to attend the noble ball. Stefan patronizingly continues the speech he began at home. Please understand, brother. The nobles of Anazot already have an axe to grind with you. It would be fine if only it concerned your work, but now they're casting aspersions on the entire Bronte family. The fact that I managed to persuade El Liberius to invite us to the ball is a sheer miracle. He's from the entourage of Archduke Melanidas and the leader of the noble militia. I beg you, Niklaus, swallow your pride and show El Liberius that you're actually someone he can work with. If you please him, you'll save your position. You suddenly tell your brother that you'll do your utmost. The ball is being held in a glorious mansion within half an hour's ride of Anazot. The house is built in the old Arknean style, like many of the homes you've seen on the outskirts of the town. The mansion is surrounded by hedgerow, an extraordinary luxury in the desiccated province of Marga. You hear the sound of music from the backyard and smell the scent of flowers. Servants obligingly escort you to the estate. The doors to the garden open. You behold no dancing couples or buffet. Where you'd expected a ball, you see only a few violin players. Upon seeing you, they hastily lift their bows from the strings. In the middle of the garden is a table set for dinner, and in the only occupied seats you see the master of the house, an elderly nobleman. Despite his advanced age, his posture and movements are those of a hardened warrior. His face bears an expression of tired serenity and slight melancholy. Ah, at last, the guests of honour have arrived. The Bronte brothers, welcome to my humble abode. Please have a seat. 
You see several armed men approaching you in the semi-darkness. Are they knights from the noble militia? You glance at Stefan. He doesn't look the least bit surprised by this turn of events. He answers your silent question. Yes, I, I knew there was no ball, but your actions have left me no other option, Judge Bronte. This is for the good of our entire family. Before you get angry, listen to what Sir El Liberius has to say. Stefan, what have you done to me? Carefully looking around, you sit down at the dinner table. The master of the house smirks and sips from his glass. Well, Sir Nicholas Bronte, I speak on behalf of all the noble families of the city. May I assume you understand the degree to which you have enraged noble society? You have inflicted numerous wounds upon the nobility of Anazot. Too many to list. But we do not wish to confine the young Bronte family into contempt and dishonour. Tomorrow morning, you will publicly declare that all your rulings against the nobles have been based on false evidence, and that the prefecture has annulled them. Therefore, the noble families will take mercy on you. Have we come to an understanding, Nicklaus? Elderberius folds his arms across his chest. Your brother shoots you impatient glances. Come on, Nicklaus, agree. The militia men in the shadows tighten the grips on their swords. The future of your career and your family is at stake, as well as your life. Oh, you're hard. <laughs> Reject the demands, a reputation and unity goes down. Accept justice goes down. Challenge him to a duel. Interesting. I'm just going to reject it. You can't make me. Determines, you stand up and inform Friedrich El Liberius that you will not accept his dishonourable demands. The elderly nobleman lets out a tired sigh and gestures to the servants, pour him more wine. So, you accuse me of dishonour? You, who have slandered the good names of so many nobles? I am afraid no one and nothing can help you now, Sir Bronte. I did what I could, Stefan. You may go now. Your brother bows guiltily. Don't listen to my brother, Seller, Sir El Liberius. He knows not what he does. I know that you would act differently, Stefan, but your blood shares the same tide as that of this impertinent young man, and your entire family will be judged by his actions. All the way home, Stefan is tense and silent. Later that night, when you enter your house, he finally explodes in a furious tirade. Are you too arrogant or too stupid? Do you have any idea what I had to do to arrange that meeting for you? But you only made our troubles worse and brought shame on the family. How did you imagine we'll ever be an noble by the sword now that you've insulted someone so close to the archduke? You ran away like a coward. You counter that Stefan lied to you from the start. He led you straight into an enemy trap. What, what, was I supposed to tell the truth? Don't make me laugh. You'd never have gone to such a meeting. All you care about is your so-called justice for the lowborn. You don't give a damn about your own family. When he hears you shouting, father comes downstairs. What's going on here? Everyone's asleep. Weren't you supposed to be at a ball? Stefan hastily relates the events of El Liberius' mansion to your father. Father pinches the bridge of his nose. His voice seems strained. Stefan, you should not have lied. It's unbecoming of a nobleman. But, Niklaus, I warned you. You've made us enemies that are more powerful still. Your brother is right. Our reputation will suffer even more now. You should have been more diplomatic. Oh, you're no better, father. You and Uncle Augustine dragged Judge Bronte here into disputing the rights of the nobility. And now you pretend it's all Niklaus' fault. Am I the only person in this family who knows what it means to live by the nobleman's lot? Your father breathes heavily, not knowing how to respond. Finally, he turns around and slams the door to his study. The clock strikes midnight, shattering the silence. <laughs> Woohoo, that was bad. Uh, the vassal and the lord, I am going to defuse the situation between Octavia and Elborn, because Octavia's come along and said that she wants Elborn to stop siding with the common folk quite so much. Well, she doesn't, the Archduke does, but she's been sent in his stead. Um, I'll be able to fuse the situation between them. Passion, here we go. So, Octavia has summoned me to Serpent Verda, which is the Melanidas castle, and she wants to get freaky. And by she wants to get freaky, I of course mean she wants to own me like a living, breathing sex toy. Uh, but I'm going to insist on being treated as her equal and not her possession. So we have now grown close, which I believe I can use later on. I'm hoping this is the right way around to do it. So with Brothers in Misery, where uh, Stefan has sent for me to come help him and Nathan out of the sticky situation they're in, I'm kind of going in for a penny with the whole losing reputation thing, so I'm gonna refuse to help because that knocks it down by two. I'm pretty sure we have had reputation hit zero before, but kind of 
want confirmation of that. So I don't know if there is an achievement for it. If there is, I haven't got it. And I've, I've done a lot of playthroughs of this at this point, so I'm kind of losing track of things. Yeah, with the case of Father Mark, so the, the heretical preacher Father Mark has been arrested. I'm going to do what we did on the Justice playthrough and judge him. So we run him through the court as opposed to handing him over to the Inquisition like we should have done. It annoys the Inquisition and it annoys Jen, but I'm okay with that. Debuckle in the shop. So we've had debuckle in the shop before, so this is triggered because justice is eight or higher. In a nutshell, the Steiners have come into the prefecture and said they want to sue a nobleman uh, who was, no, what was his name? Gustav L. Verger. They want to sue him for thievery because he came into their shop and just decided, you know what, I'm going to have that, I'm going to have that, I'm going to have that. And while they were in the prefecture accusing him and trying to get the ball rolling on that, he came storming in and was like, no, no, I wish to have them arrested for murder. And obviously, murdering a nobleman, no matter how good the common rights are, is still a big no-no. However, they have said in their trial that they didn't kill him. They kind of pushed him back a little bit because he was being crazy and trying to burn their shop down. He fell over, hit his head and died. Before, I punished them because I didn't want justice to go up to 10. Whereas this time, I'm completely okay with that. So Justice is going to hit 10 now, and that's good. And we are going to acquit them, and they get to live free. And Gustav can suck a dick, because he's just the worst. The Steiners were merely protecting themselves. They broke no law, because, you know, they didn't. You rise, cutting off the racket in the room, and begin your speech. You gesture passionately, putting all your faith in the power of Justice into every word. You've heard both parties and are ready to deliver your verdict. However much El Verger may cling to the lots, he is not in church. He's in a court of law, and this court's duty is to judge all the estates and decide all cases fairly. This case is of a nobleman who believes he has the right to rob and murder commoners as he sees fit. The Steiners are completely innocent. They were merely defending themselves against El Verger's assault. They're free to go. On pain of punishment, El Verger must not persecute these people further or make any attempt on their property. The courtroom is stunned by your decision. For a few moments, everyone is frozen, unable to believe that you have just acquitted the killers of a nobleman. Then the common folk burst into cheers. The guards escort the enraged El Verger out of the room by force. Flummoxed, the Steiners talk over each other in their haste to thank you. The other judges stare at you in horror. The trial is over. Flummoxed is such a good word. Well then, Bronte, it's a shame you didn't follow my advice. Now the Lowborn have nothing to stop them from taking up arms. Well, there's a terrible storm brewing. We can only hope we won't be smashed against the rocks. Don't worry, Elborn. Everything's going according to plan. My plan, no one else's plan, no one else wants this outcome, just me. Doo -doo. Friend of the people. We must know this one. What is this one? Oh, yes, of course. So, Mayor Egmont comes along. And obviously he's been pretty cool up until this point, and he's like, Hey Nicholas, we used to have dynamite in the mines. We no longer have dynamite in the mines. Can we please have dynamite back in the mines? It's illegal to own gunpowder. And obviously mining silver without gunpowder is hard work. I agreed before, which kind of backfired on me a little bit. I mean, it doesn't really matter, does it? Because me and him want the same thing. So even though he's lying to me about the use of the gunpowder and he's going to give it to the rebels, I kind of don't care. I'm going to give it to him anyway. Yeah, it's just going to help everything move in the direction I want it to move in. Can't say fairer than that, really, can you? And my hands are clean. I didn't give it to the rebels. I'm innocent, governor. A rendezvous with Octavia, right? Let's see if I've made the right decisions up until this point. But please, Lady Octavia, tell me your woes. Yes. Inquire about this arcane knowledge. So then we will grow close, which means we can then... No, we're already growing close. Well, hopefully this means we can actually do something later on. You ask Octavia about the lost knowledge she's been seeking. So we've gone for a bit of afternoon delight, but she's very distracted. She's talking about feeling trapped in a cage of her own nobility, and she wants to try and find a way to escape, which is obviously the Latari, but we don't know that yet. So we're going to inquire about it. You carefully inquire about the lost knowledge Octavia is speaking of. What's she trying to find in these ancient manuscripts? Octavia responds with a playful smile. She takes your hand and leads you into her chambers. There, under the flickering candlelight, she covers you with a semi-transparent gold-coloured veil. 
Then, she puts a mysterious mask of the same colour over your face. Don't speak. You'll understand. Let me in. Octavia entwines her fingers with yours and starts singing. You have never heard this language before. The song is a slow, inhuman drawl. At first, nothing happens. You listen to Octavia's song, watching the glimmer of the candlelight on her face and the walls of her chamber. Everything is gently shifting. And when she cometh near, fear not, but hasten not towards her. Octavia's lips are not moving. The words seem to take shape inside your head by themselves. The skin on your limbs has taken on a different hue. Now it's blue like that of the Argonauts. Who's sitting opposite you? Octavia? Yourself? You can't tell anymore. Everything has become one. The world fades away and shatters. Your bodies, the walls, the rooms, the buildings, the city. Everything grows pale and dissolves into the light. All of it, the lots, the empire, the twin gods themselves, is but a dream. And you have wandered through this dream all your life. You come to your senses in the dead of night in Lady Melanidas's bed. She's lying beside you, asleep, naked, her black hair spilled across the pillow. You run your trembling fingers over her skin. Octavia is sleeping soundly. Mmm. The Lottery really is fascinating. Like, their whole philosophy that everything is a construct of, of their own, like, imagination. It's, it's genuinely very fascinating. I'm hoping when it comes to the Lottery Society, I can actually join their circle properly this time. So we're at the point where we're searching for evidence against Doris Otten. Um, I'm literally just going to not waste my time on it, because we've, we've never done this before. It ups career a little bit, but so. Uh, I don't need the evidence against him, so we may as well do this, because if I try and get the evidence, I'm going to die. And I don't wish to die. I still have three deaths in the bag, but I'd rather not use them. Father's right. There's no reason to risk your well-being and the well-being of your friends and family like this. This way, you will not antagonise the aristocracy. With no noble human or Archean perceiving you as a threat, your career will be secure and it may even flourish. You'll refrain from pursuing Otten for now and commit only the minimum effort necessary to this case. Without leaving your office, you draw up a detailed list of Otten's potential transgressions and indicate that acquiring credible evidence for these crimes is currently impossible. The Legion officers who have fallen victim to Otten's sword are unlikely to speak of the jewels, anxious as they are to avoid getting challenged again. For many of them, another jewel would be their last. The lack of formal complaints from the officers or their families makes the inaction even easier. The officers met their deaths in the line of duty. What else is there to say? You add these conclusions to the thin folder against Otten, then file it away and move on to other cases. One day, Prefect Elborn pays you a visit to see your progress firsthand. You're saying you've learned nothing else of note, Bronte. What a pity. The Legion soldiers are not the only ones who fear Commander Otten, it seems. I hoped you'd be braver than your father, but this is understandable. A dangerous case like this is nothing but a hindrance to a promising young judge who seeks to advance his career, is it not? Well then, it saddens me to say it, but so far we lack the evidence to have the commander indicted, especially since he is a highborn Archean. But this is only the beginning. The situation could change at any moment. I see you've put away Otten's case to focus on others. Quite sensible, seeing as we have no alternative right now. If we want to have a chance of getting him indicted in court, we need to make the nobles in the province recognise jewels as acts of murder. This means defying a tradition of old, a road perilous and seldom travelled. It means enforcing the rule of law over the Anazot gentry. For now, Bronte, return to your other duties and pay particular attention to any duelling incidents. We will take our next step against Sir Otten when the time is right. At the end of the day, you run into your father on the way out of the office. As you go down the winding staircase leading to the exit, he gives you a quick hug when no one's looking. I spoke to Elborn Niklaus. He's disappointed in you, but don't take it personally. You chose to avoid the ire of people more powerful than us who did the right thing. It's much easier for Elborn to get involved in something like this. He's a baron and a noble of the sword, and Arcnean's word won't be enough to have him executed. You, on the other hand, don't have that privilege. You can't bring any hope or justice to this world if you're dead. This case, sir, uh, is much more serious than it may seem. Even Sir Otten, a highborn Arcnean though he is, is just a pawn in a much larger game. The Bronte family would do well to stay off the board entirely. Yes, father. I'm still on 30 willpower. That's amazing. Stefan's gambit. I have agreed to help Stefan in his plan of marrying off Gloria. I don't know if this is actually going to be necessary for this playthrough or not, but 
it's what I've chosen to do. A realm unknown. So this is our first official introduction to the Latari Society. So the prefecture has received a letter about uh, a group of nobles that are up to some shady business and we need to go and check it out and shut them down. Turns out it's Lady Octavia and the Latari Society. Perfect. So if I keep their secrets, then it does knock my justice down to nine, which isn't wonderful, but I'm going to do that anyway, because I want to. And I'm sure I have a chance to bump up my justice again. You promise Octavia to keep the circle of Latari secret, and plus that gets me the Latari ritual destiny, which I think I've had before. I think we got that in the priestly playthrough. You promise Octavia not to tell a soul about the circle of Latari, and ensure the prefecture is none the wiser. You'll tell the prefect that this gathering of young nobles is just an elaborate yet harmless amusement that poses no threat to public order whatsoever. The Arcnian lady rewards you with an enigmatic smile. I expected nothing less, Nicolas Bronte. I value your loyalty. This circle is the most important thing in my life right now. I mean, that hurts my feelings, but alright, whatever. If only we were alone, so I could show you the full extent of my gratitude. But the great mystery of this night is about to begin. Since you have joined us tonight, Nicolas, you will take part in it. Octavia withdraws, walks to the centre of the room, and raises her arms. The voices and music fall silent. Form a circle, O chosen ones, and join hands. Direct your thoughts and feelings towards the circle centre, towards me. Become one with me, become one inside the circle, become Latari. Before you unite, the masked people have formed a large circle. They begin to move. It's a strange, slow dance devoid of music. Their movements are unlike any dance you know. Intertwined arms become an embrace, and that embrace then becomes intertwined arms yet again. Everyone dances, and the dance sweeps you away and absorbs you as well. You see golden faces moving all around. Deep within, you begin to feel a strange connection to them. It's as if you've known them all along. As if you've known yourself as a being with a gilded, delicate face. You are united. One with the people who surround you. Insecure no more. Uneasy no more. All of you dissolved and blended within this space. You are one. You are Lotari. You are the truth. Beyond you, there is nothing. The world around grows dull. The fragments are falling away. Your bodies, the walls, the houses, the city, everything grows dull and disappears in the light. There's only one Latari. Beyond them, there is nothing. The world was but a dream, and you have awoken from it. The music stops, and the circle breaks apart. Your back is perfectly straight, your head held high, as if you actually glimpsed another world through other eyes during the short time you spent here. You shudder at this thought. The minutes spent in this strange dance. What were they? That you do not know. But the law, the lot, the empire itself, they did not exist so long as this dance of unity lasted. Do you understand now? Do you see why there's nothing in the world more important to me than this circle? This world holds us like a prison, yet there can be another. A world free from the twins and their design. Ah, oh, I can glimpse it, but if only I could step into it. Octavia cuts her speech short. She looks at you intently. But this is only my concern and my responsibility, because I want it to be so. Do not return here, Nicklaus. You've seen enough. You'll bring danger upon the circle if you're seen coming here again. The next day, you report to Elborn and tell him that his concerns are baseless. There was no sign of a noble plot whatsoever. It was nothing but a costume party hosted by several young nobles seeking entertainments, and sweet pleasures belong to the nobles by their lot. Do they not? Oh, I figured as much. I'm glad we didn't stick the gendarmes on them. I just hope the Secret Chancellery and Sir El Fero never hear of this report. I doubt the advisor would be as tolerant of their youthful amusements. Well then, you may return to Watton's case, Bronte. As you sift through yet another pile of paperwork, you can't help but think of the Circle of Latari again. There can be no doubt. The members of the Circle are pretending to be a long extinct race. They are therefore revolting against the Empire. Not in the streets, but in their minds. And this is an even bigger threat. The followers of Latari have escaped punishments, and you have been among them. Mm. Doot -doot. Yes, we did have that before. Because I took part in the ritual while I was a priest, which was massively heathenous on me. Threats and promises. So, I've been summoned to Remy L. Verman's office for a meeting, and we are ambushed by Doris Otten, who's also there. He knows about the case that Elborn's building against him, and he wants me to put a stop to it, which 
is fine because I don't have any interest in building that case against him at the moment, so I will just put him at ease, which I've never done before. Every other time I've retaliated against him and died for my trouble. You mollify the outraged Archean, assuring him that the case poses no threat to him whatsoever. Because if I give him my word, it knocks down my justice, which I cannot have. No sir, no how. Defying Otten's will now means facing true death by his sword, and your family will be left to suffer next. You have no choice but to lie and mislead the enraged Archean, doing what you can to mollify him. I mean, I'm not lying. And so you bow deeply and speak as meekly as you can. Indeed, you say. His Excellency has every right to feel wronged by the Prefecture. There is indeed a folder with his name on it in the archives. But you do not seek to besmirch Otten's honourable name. No, quite the contrary. You have merely been told to investigate slanderous rumours of illegal jewels, and so far you found no evidence that could tarnish the honour of the commander of Magra. It's true Sir Rotten is an impeccable master of the sort, and no opponent could duel him without suffering a lesser death, but his excellency had every right to duel whoever he chooses. You, on the other hand, are but a humble servant of the law. To you, even the thought of initiating litigation against an Archean lord is simply unthinkable. Who would ever seek to judge guilty those who have been chosen by the gods themselves to rule over the rest of the Empire? Ah, quit your grovelling, Bronte. I don't need to waste my time on a duel to see you're no threat to me. So much the better for me, then. The Archduke is expecting me already. But pray to the twins if I hear even a word of this so-called case ever again. Farewell. Otten quickly walks out of the Magistrate's office. Once his cape has disappeared down the long corridor, El Vermin turns to you with a smile of approval. I see you're getting more and more accustomed to knowing your place, Bronto. The likes of you are always a perfect fit in the ranks of power, even if you will never reach the very top. Once again, I am pleased to have you with us. You leave the city hall with a heavy heart. Sir Elborn wants Othan's case to progress, and so it will. No matter how much you have to bluff and delude those in power, Othan's sword will continue to loom over you until the case comes to an end. Okay, that was fine. Nobleman's Honour. So this is where I can kill the Court of Honour, which is good, and gets my career back up to 10. And drops my reputation to zero. We've been sent to a crime scene. Uh, there is a, the dead body of a nobleman who has died in an illegal duel with El Corvio. Remiel Vermin is also there. He wants us to let El Corvio go, or at the very least just fine El Corvio. Every other time while I've been trying to get justice, I have just sentenced him to capital punishment. Last time when I was on career, the career path, I fined him. However, this time we are going to pronounce the Court of Honor illegal. You ban meetings of the Court of Honor itself to prevent any such duels in the future, which is going to be just great for pissing off Remy L. Vermin because he just happens to be the head of the Court of Honor. So sucks to be him. You shake your head dispassionately, enunciating every word with perfect precision. You explain the situation to L. Vermin. A murder in a duel is still a murder, and the punishment for murder is execution. You don't have the right to distort the law. Courts of honour are hoary relics of the past, left over from an age when nobles had no law above them. The times have changed. The courts of honour ought to remain in the past. The magistrate begins boiling with rage. Banning the court of honour? You out of your mind, Bronte. The court of honour is a tradition older than the Empire itself. Or if you try to strike at us, you will regret it tenfold. Who do you think you are? You're no one. It seems El Vermin is not aware that you have friends in very high places, you tell him in turn. El Corvio will stand trial and the Court of Honour will be banned. The Magistrate dashes to El Corvio, fuming with fury. Sir El Corvio, this is a terrible misunderstanding. I'll do everything I can to right this wrong, but these good sirs mean to have you arrested. You give the gendarmes a firm order. Seize the murderer's sword, shackle him, and take him to the Prefecture. The gendarmes are as flabbergasted by your words as El Corvio himself. But upon seeing your resolve, they begin to act. You dare call me a murderer? Hasn't anyone in your filthy, decrepit province know the meaning of a duel? El Corvio draws his sword and assumes a defensive stance, startling the gendarmes with such a fervent refusal to comply. You start giving commands to the gendarmes. Following your orders, they manage to surround and disarm El Corvio. You return to the prefecture to assemble a board of justice. You describe the matter at hand to the judges you've selected. You try to convince them that the Court of Honour stands in opposition to Imperial law and must therefore be made illegal in the province of Marlborough. After a long debate filled with warnings against this shocking measure, your insistence and your influence in the city 
eventually win the board of judges over to your side. The morning after, you present the new order to the prefects to be signed. Elborn stares at you with genuine respect in his eyes, polishing the court of honour is most brazen blonde hair, if not outright absurd. But this is the only way we can really change things. Judge Bronte, prepare to weather a hailstorm when this commences. I shall do my best to protect you, but I am not all-powerful. I'm glad to see I was right to put my trust in you, Bronte. El Corvio is found guilty. He is banned from ever entering Marlborough and has to pay a significant fine to the El Este family. The outsider's threats have no consequences. Soon, rumours begin to appear. They say the convicted noble was indeed a traitor to the crown. He fell out of favour with the Emperor shortly after returning to Eterna. However, it doesn't take long for the consequences of outlawing the Court of Honour to be felt. Threats and complaints from all ranks of the aristocracy arrive by the hundreds. Such insolence. Matters of honour now remain at an impasse because of your ignoble laws. Elborn assigns a couple of gendarmes to serve as your bodyguards in the city until the unrest is quelled. Your family feels the impact as well. How could you do such a thing, Niklaus? Do you have any idea what I've heard about us from the highest nobles of the city? I'd have to duel them myself if you hadn't outlawed the Court of Honour. You've endured the storm calmly, however, firmly believing that you have done the right thing. There's nothing higher than Imperial law, and every soul who lives in the Empire has to accept it, no matter who they are. Boom. And now we are a disgraced family. Oh, achievement! Okay. That is done. That is one of my three things ticked off the list. Uh -oh. To mark this one. I feel like I definitely have had this before. Recent events have dealt a crushing blow to the reputation of the Bronte family. You have slipped into the realm of infamy and disgrace. So far, the noble families of the city have patiently endured your transgressions, but now you have lost face in their eyes. Noble society is eager to bring your every dusty scandal back into light. Old offences, ancient grievances, and naturally, father's marriage to Lilia Bronte and Gloria's ignoble origins. And they have surely not forgotten that the sons of Robert and Lilia Bronte, Niklaus and Nathan, were born out of wedlock. None of the nobles will ever say this to your face, of course. Their behaviour will seem perfectly ordinary, not on the surface. But no matter where you go now, you will be followed by scornful glances and dismissive whispers. Oh, we have to accept this humbly and bear this burden. All hope of being ennobled by the sword is lost. No matter what we do to restore our name, we will never wash away this mark of dishonour. That's fine. It's fine. Cool. So yeah, we definitely have had that before. I figured we would have done, but... I just couldn't remember. So, Philippe El Ferro has come to visit us with a list of people he wants us to have arrested. So he's hunting down the last straw, and this list of people is... They're people he says are members of the last straw and need to be arrested. So we're going to do what we've done before and protect the people on the list, because that bumps up our justice and our unity, which I feel unity is kind of a helpful thing to have right now, considering it's all the family has left. And we're about to take a hit on it when Mama dies. So I don't think we've got enough unity to save Mummy Dearest. So me and Stefan have reached an impasse with Gloria in terms of the whole like marrying her off scenario. So we're going to use use Mother as our weapon to talk Gloria into doing it, which is upsettingly going to knock down our unity, which I just got back up. Justice for all. The Overseer, Gaius Tempest, has paid a visit to Sir Elborn and has said that there is an Archean that needs to be arrested. Some Legion soldiers were out hunting the last straw, and they had them cornered, and then an Arknean came out and killed them. Which is not good, because, I mean, obviously it's an Arknean, they can notoriously do as they please, but the fact this Arknean has sided with the rebels is a big problem for the Overseer. So he's been arrested, we have him in court, and now we need to figure out what to do with him. So I have turned to Octavia Frey before, I've acquitted him of all charges, but neither of these things are good for my justice, so I'm going to provoke the Arknean, which increases my justice, but it kills me. <laughs> Thankfully, I'm only one death in so far, so that's fine. I've got deaths to spare. You take advantage of the tense situation to provoke the defendant to draw his sword. Let's do it. As passions in the courtroom are running high, you prepare yourself for what's about to come. Your hand clutching at the hilt of your sword, your eyes studying the young Arknean's heated face as he fervently affirms the justice of his position. Your eyes studying the young Arknean's heated face as he fervently affirms the justice of his position. Then, you announce that the prosecution must continue to read the charges against the defendant. The courtroom grows quiet, and you continue your opening remarks. 
Sir Anthony Fess has publicly declared that he does not accept Imperial law. Does this mean that Sir Fess is willing to take any life in the courtroom for the sake of his cause, just as he took those of five Legion soldiers? I have as much faith in your law as you do, Your Honour, but I would never kill anyone without cause. I fight for the common people. Slowly, you approach the defendants, your hand ready on the hilt of your sword. But then it seems Sir Fess is not truly willing to go all the way for his cause. Is he not ready to prove in public to everyone, without fear, that the law must not be obeyed? You don't speak those last few words, you scream them in the Archean's face. No, you continue. You're more than a traitor, Sir Fess. You're a coward and a liar. A grimace of pure hatred contorts the young Archean's face. He draws his sword and attacks you in an instant. Everyone in the courtroom freezes in terror. How dare you call me a liar? I'm not afraid of you, nor the Legion, nor the Emperor himself. Anthony Fess assaults you with a storm of slashes and strikes. You parry them furiously, but you cannot withstand the strength and skill of an Archean. He presses you to the wall of the podium, all eyes on the fight. The gendarmes rush to your aid, but the Archean's blade flashes so quickly that it cannot even hope to approach you. You mount your last defence, your strength failing. The frenzied young Archean strikes you down with all his fury, almost as if he sees you as the embodiment of all injustice in the Empire. You're too slow to parry his next blow. The steel sinks into your heart. With a burst of chilling pain, it shudders and stops. A lady's muffled scream from deep within the courtroom is the last thing you hear. Dead. You return to life upon the slab of stone set in the centre of the family crypt. Naked, blank, reborn. A massive silhouette in a heavy cloak leans over you. It takes you some time to recognise your own father. Oh, at last you've returned, sir. You had him found guilty, but at the cost of your own life. Were you prepared for this? I do not know. But your sacrifice was not in vain. The Archean Antony Fess has been exiled to the Northern Isles. His entire family estate will go to the Overseer. After the assault in the courtroom, no Archean could say a word against it. He was convicted of treason and conspiracy against the Crown. Needless to say, this is a singular occasion for our province. Gaius Tempest is pleased with the way you resolve the trial against the Archean insurgent. We have received the letter expressing his gratitude. Your career is sure to soar now. Our family is favoured by the Overseer. Now we must use that favour wisely before it's gone. But just think of the sheer scale of the situation you've gotten yourself involved in. The Archean sentence is the talk of Anazot. Everyone saw that the law has power even over the higher race, though the common folk still bemoan the fate of the only Archean defiant enough to fight for their cause. As you walk up the stairs out of the crypts, you can't help but remember the young Archean's eyes, the way they burned you with a righteous flame, the way he risked it all for the common estate. In the end, Anthony Fest was sacrificed for justice, although it was not the kind of sacrifice he had in mind. Ugh. Hopefully, I i mean, I can still have one more death, so that's fine. Oh, now mummy's gonna die. Is mummy gonna die? Mummy's gonna die. I was i was 50% of the way to saving her. So close. Transformation. Lady Octavia has performed the Latari transformation ritual, so she is now theoretically dead. She killed herself, but now she's been reborn as ex-Octavia, a Latarian. So every other time I've done this, I've demanded that Octavia be returned to her family because we've been sent to find her by Archduke Melanidas. However, this time, I can either accept my beloved's transformation, or I can open myself to the truth of the Latari. Either way, we lose reputation and gain spiritual bond. Uh, however, opening myself to the truth of the Latari, I can do because I've had because I've done the Latari ritual. So I'm going to do this. You ask the Latari to open your eyes to the true nature of things, because, like I said before, it's fascinating. Dazed by the encounter, you look at the creature into which Octavia transformed before your very eyes. You can't help but think of the only other Latarian ritual you've seen. The gilded faces, the intoxicating dance, the strange connection that made everyone and everything seem as one. The world falling apart into shards of dreams. Until there is was the Latari. What is the, what's that even meant to say? Until there was only the Latari. We'll go with that. Octavia chose this path, and she has walked it to the end. Carefully, you reach out and put your hand on the shoulder of the creature that was once Octavia. Its body is so delicate now, so fragile, that you fear to shatter it with a single touch. The gaze of its abyssal, almond-shaped eyes is utterly inhuman. You ask the now reborn Octavia to show you the truth of her new existence. Is there a way for her to share this experience with you? There's a strange glimmer in the creature's dark eyes as it gazes at you. You are still human, Niklaus Bronte. 
Your nature will not allow you to comprehend that you only exist within our mind. But the one called Octavia remembers how you sought to understand the Latari. She will show you that which you will be able to see. All of a sudden, the Latari takes your arms and puts them on its head. Your body reacts to this touch with a flurry of emotions and sensations you can't even attempt to describe. The creature then turns its head and looks at you. Its eyes are nothing. Emptiness. Darkness. It swallows you in an instant. For an unknown time, you cease to exist. No family, no calling, no people, no things. Never born, never died, never lived. You ought to be terrified, you realise. But the man who ought to be terrified has ceased to exist all the same. Only what you see in your mind's eye exists now. You see a little Arknian girl sleeping in an exquisite bed, surrounded by nothing but darkness. The rest of the world is only her dream. She dreams of a prison of gilded cages and noble parties and dances and mansions, all surrounded by a moat of blood that is her father's blood tide. She dreams of trying to flee, prying the bars apart, only to slam into the bars of an even larger cage. The twins tower above her. The cage is their greatest design. The girl is crying now. She's realised that there is nothing outside of the cage. But suddenly, the Arknion girl wakes up. She sees herself sleeping. She sees her own dream. She gets out of bed and walks away. And then the lots and the blood tide, and the empire and the twins and their design, they all shatter and turn into ash, for the girl has awakened. She suddenly realises that the world is far larger than this dream. She can create it on her own now. She's within the Latari. She's no longer trapped. She herself is Latari. You emerge from the blackness of those Latari eyes just as suddenly as you'd plunged into oblivion. You too could have stopped being human, Nicolaus Bronte. But you have your own path to walk. You cannot create a world of your own. You are too busy struggling within a cage that is not of your own design. The Lotari will meet you again, but for now, we must see the world through new eyes. Onward. The creature's fingers trace the outlines of your face. Your body reacts to this touch with a flurry of emotions and sensations you cannot even begin to describe. The creature once known throughout the province as Octavia Melanidas floats down the stairs and disappears from sight. Dazed, you watch the members of the circle part and walk away without a word. You are soon left alone. As soon as you recover from this experience, you head to Castle Serpent Verda. The Archduke will not tolerate any delays when it comes to his daughter's fate. The guards escort you to the ancient throne room, the same room where Octavia once met you herself. On the throne sits the Archduke, sullen and dour. His face resembles that of a bird of prey. His lips are tightly pressed, his body is hunched and tense. You kneel before the reigning lord of the province. I have no time for formalities, Bronte. Tell me what happened to Octavia. You remain kneeling. You tell him that you've been unable to find Octavia. You searched all across the city and questioned everyone who had ties to the Archduke's daughter, but it was all in vain. You have failed to carry out his order. Archduke Melanidas listens, showing no emotion, but his hand clutches at his scepter harder and harder with every word. Does he even believe what you're saying? You had a service you could have performed for me, Bronte, a service that would have brought honour to your family. Instead, you failed me. I will remember this when your father requests to be ennobled by the sword. You shall forget all ties you had to Octavia, as well as my orders, forever. The high road takes you back to Anazots, empty in the dark night. You can't help but think of Octavia, or of the creature she's become. The creature that called itself Latari has disappeared without a trace. The Archduke's men scour the entire city but can't find her. Will you ever see her fragile, ethereal silhouette again? Yes. Yes, we will. Assuming I survive peacetime. That's Gloria's wedding day and I'm going to choose to maintain family ties with Gloria. Stefan wants to cut all ties with her because he's a prick, but we'll maintain it, which our reputation can't possibly be any lower. And it gets our unity back up to three, which means hopefully the family will be able to stay together. We shall find out soon on that front, I guess. Okay, do we get to stay together? We do! We can preserve the family! Whee! I'll take it. It's a tiny, tiny little silver lining, but it's a silver lining nonetheless. The smell of gunpowder. So you remember that meeting that I had with Mayor Eggman that I said was going to come back to bite me in the arse? This is it coming back to bite me in the arse. Although it's not going to bite me in the arse because... Ow, oh, my eardrums. Because that has put my... I mean, my justice was already at 10, but that bumps my justice all the way up to 10. Which means now... Bop, bop. So now a leader Sirin, who is a member of the last draw, has been arrested after an explosion. With the gunpowder I provided for mining duties only, I might add. She's been arrested. 
and then while you're interrogating her mayor Egmont also comes in and he's been arrested and then we get a chance to have a little one-on-one -on -one chat with him and he goes hey I'm working with the rebels let's let's team up buddy let's do this together we can take him down when I was doing the justice playthrough I was horrified by this because I was like, no, I didn't, I was not signing up for this. I was actively trying to avoid this. But this time I'm going to help them escape. Oh my God, that kills me. Seriously. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure this is then going to lead on to the ending that I want. It's called Broken Chains. I'm going to get some wealth out of it. My career goes down to zero. Willpower is cut in half. I die again. Oh, and Mayor Eggman's leading the revolt. Interesting, interesting, interesting. This will be the first time Mayor Eggman's leading the revolt. Every other time the revolt started with Sophia in charge. This is an interesting development. After a slight pause, you agree with Eggman's plan. You will help him escape. But no one can know that you're involved or you'll end up swinging from the same gallows as the fugitives. Eggman's face brightens. I knew you wouldn't abandon this cause, Bronte. You've just made history. Now hurry, there's no time to spare. You walk up the stairs nonchalantly. You command the gendarmes to bring the prisoners Mayor Egmont and Elida Syrian to the backyard of the prefecture. You will hand the insurgents over to the secret chancellery personally. The gendarmes shrug and go down to the dungeon. You put the key to their shackles in your pockets. The prisoners are led out to the backyard. As you accompany them, you discreetly slip the key into Elida Syrian's hat. You find yourselves in the empty yard behind the prefecture, but the gendarmes continue to stand guard. They're in no hurry to leave the prisoners alone. Before you can say anything, a leader Syrian suddenly waves her arms, now free of the shackles. The gendarmes rush towards the criminal, but she leaps behind you and wraps the chain with which she's just been shackled around your neck. What are you doing? I was helping you. The rebel's thin arms are shockingly strong. The chain digs into your neck. You open your mouth helplessly, gasping for air. The gendarmes, stupefy, do not risk coming any nearer. Meanwhile, Mayor Eggman shakes off his shackles as well. Don't move, or the judge gets it. The gendarmes freeze in hesitation. Alida drags you along with her, retreating towards the street. The world is going dark before your eyes. You can't breathe. Egmont moves after you and quickly whispers in your ear. As promised, you're free of suspicion. See you in the new world, Citizen Bronte. The chain tightens around your neck. Convulsions overtake you. You double over, trying to grab your neck, but to no avail. Then, the light in your eyes abruptly winks out. Good. God, woman, that was unnecessary. You find yourself in the darkness and cold of the family crypt. Shaking, you run your hands over your new body. You touch your neck involuntarily. There's no sign of strangulation. You are renewed. It's time to return to the world. What happened while you were beyond this realm? The prisoners managed to escape. Mayor Egmont is lying low, preparing to put his plan into action. They're searching for him all over the city, but in vain. You expect to share his fate, but no one's inclined to blame you for the rebels' escape. After all, you were killed at their hands right in front of the gendarmes. But the secret chancellery issues an order to suspend you from judicial service for a month. Felipe Elfero deems it necessary to inquire into your possible connection with the insurgents. But no direct evidence can be found, not even by the secret chancellery's best sleuths. Egmont wasn't lying. He's done his best to keep you out of the line of fire. You regain your position, but your reputation is tarnished. After a long while, you return to your office. Through the window of your carriage, you see the streets you've known since you were a child, but you can't recognise your own city. Commoners no longer cower by the walls, but stroll right in the middle of the street. Many of them carry axes or clubs on their belts. Noble conveyances try to get behind the tall fences of the mansions as soon as they can. There are gatherings, sermons, and furious cries on every street corner. Mayor was right. The city is one step away from an uprising. Or perhaps that step was taken the day you freed the conspirators. Ho -ho. Bye -bye. Okay, we've done it. With great unease, you peer out of the window of your office at the street below. Otten's case has been put aside, unfinished. You spent several years of your life preparing for that trial, but it's too late to decide the fate of a single arc here now. Through your advocacy and protection, the common people have grown bold and are now ready to take justice into their own hands. The age of nobles governing commoners is no more. A large mob has gathered in the square in front of the prefecture, and many of the lowborn are waving clubs and hatchets. They have piled boxes and crates into the middle of the square. Their leader, Mayor Egmont, now rises to his impromptu podium. He has abandoned his typically luxurious attire for a plain shirt and pants. People of Anazot! 
The time has come. They humiliate us. They squeeze us dry. They obey no laws. We're not going to take it anymore. We're not just some lowborn rabble. The Empire stands on the shoulders of the common estate. We're in charge. The excited mob echoes his call with passion. We're in charge! Egmont raises a hand and points at the window of the prefecture behind him. The judges and the law are on our side. We will have the same rights as the noble estate. We will make the new faith illegal. We will return the city and the province to the people who live in this land, who feed it, who toil for it. We're in charge. The crowd's cries shake the windows of your office. Their excitement has reached a fever pitch. More and more people keep flocking to the square from every street. Elborn appears behind you. He is visibly pale. Without a word, he watches it all unfold. Follow me, people. We're going to occupy City Hall. We're going to take over this city and demand the Overseer recognise our rights. Onward, to the City Hall. Whoa. But then, on the very edge of the square, cavalry troops bearing the Archduke's banners come into view. They form a line, their swords at the ready. The noble militia of Anazots, the city's prized warriors, are prepared to attack. Elborn cannot suppress a loud, terrified gasp. <gasps> Edmund, oh that lunatic. He's gotta get these people killed. We should have left him behind the bars. Do not be afraid. Stay where you are. They will never dare to attack us. Come on, Sophia. Where are your fighters? The cavalry moves. The riders crash into the mob. People flee in terror, pushing, shoving, screaming trying to outrun the hooves of the neighbouring horses. The noble militias hack at the rioters without mercy. Soon, several riders reach Mayor Egmont. They drag him from the podium and ride away with the quarry. Oh, the poor man, he's finished. What was he thinking? The other riders remain in the square, corralling the mob, cutting down anyone in their way. But then, from the crowd, a loud salvo. Gunfire. Thick black smoke wafts over the square. And then another. The cavalrymen fall, their gilded armour pierced by bullets. The horses buck, startled by the loud noise, throwing their noble riders in terror and trampling those who fall beneath their hooves. You spot people with long muskets and rifles dotting the square. There's smoke everywhere. Thunderous gunshots and mayhem roar. The riders who survive run for their lives. What remains of the mob flees to the square as well. A woman in a plain grey dress climbs to the top of the abandoned podium. Something about her limping gait seems vaguely familiar to you. All of you, listen to me. The nobles will never trample the common folk ever again. We have weapons. We have numbers. We are the last straw. The days of the old regime are numbered. They stood in our way today, but we will not be stopped. Get your weapons, people. Get ready to fight. We're coming back here tomorrow. Elborn watches it all unfold, terrified. But what have we done, Niklaus? This is how the common people use the freedom we've given them. All our plans and good intentions, they're gonna drown it all in blood. No. No, I'm not letting any of those lunatics ruin my life's work. We must act, Bronte, you and I. We started this. Now we must end this calamity and save the city, even if it means violating our oaths and sacrificing our honour. Prepare yourself, Judge Bronte. A storm is coming. Well... Uh, achievement! So Egmont wasn't in charge for all that long. I feel like Sophia may have screwed him on that, deliberately holding back support until he was already dead. What a cow! So we had three things in mind that we wanted to do going into this. We've done two of them. We've killed the cause of honour and the rebels have taken control. So one more thing left to do. The revolt begins. You leave the prefecture feeling uneasy. Your determined struggle for justice and equality before the law has led the people of Margaret to feel empowered for the first time. Sensing their strength, they have taken up arms. Is this really what you were striving for? After the last confrontation between the rebels and the noble militia in front of the prefecture, the city has fallen silence. A traveller passing by would think that life in Anazots is carrying on as usual, but rumours about the massacre in which the last straw slaughtered the noble cavalry have already reached every house in the city. For the first time in memory, commoners have dared to take up arms against their masters. Mayor Egmont tried to demand rights for the lowly estates, but he was quickly defeated. Now his place has been taken by the last straw. The former underground movement led by the merciless Sophia will stop at nothing in their struggle for a new order. And their numbers are growing. The time for peaceful appeals has passed. The wrath of the people is gaining momentum by the hour. Their rulers can no longer appease them by throwing them a bone and slightly loosening their grip. The commoners of Anazot are ready to fight to the true death for their rights. 
Remy L. Zerman is already dead. His life taken by the verdict of the People's Courts. He was strangled by the mob that broke into the City Hall. The Magistrate's lifeless body now hangs just outside the windows of his office for all to see. Whether you want it or not, the revolt cannot be stopped now. Yeesh! The family, we'll just keep the family in the city. Why not? Gets me some willpower. And also, I don't want to have to go through the hassle of trying to get them to flee because it won't end well. It's just occurred to me I'm not actually on a side of the revolt yet either. There we go. Fading light. I'd be interested to see if I can avoid choosing a side. Okay, so what can we do with X Octavia? Share a final moment with her before she leaves this world. Oh, she left a trace. I don't know if this is going to do anything, but I'm curious. And this is what I wanted to do. This is the, the path with her I wanted to take. If your beloved wants to leave this world, then so be it. You will accept her decision. But perhaps she can leave something behind. Impart some kind of wisdom about her newfound existence before her departure. Hey, I got my achievement! Perfect. You reach out to the creature that was once your lover. The thought that Octavia will never return makes your heart ache. But you accept her choice to leave. You take the being before you by a slender hand. Under your breath, you whisper a final farewell. The world created by the twins is a cruel one indeed. You understand why the Latari would wish to leave it. Thanks to the ritual, you have sojourned beyond it yourself. But there are still so many humans and Arcneans desperately locked in the chains of this existence, just as Octavia Melanidas once was. The Latari must not depart from this world without leaving something behind. Some shred of truth she has worked so hard to unveil. The creature's large, pitch black eyes close for a moment. When they open again, you see tears in them. But what a terrible world the twins have created. The Latari know how much they suffer from the flaws in their own creation. Those who live in this world must still have hope, even as their world burns around them. Their minuscule spark of life is not the only one in the universe. The Latarian ritual. You recall how it felt, and for a moment, the streets, scarred by the uprising, seem unreal to you. An unnatural composition made by chance out of hundreds of tiny particles, like an image in a kaleidoscope. It's quiet. Water splashes in the fountain. You gingerly put your hand on the strange, golden being's shoulder. It's so warm. She strokes your head. You can barely feel her slim fingers. Octavia cared for you. You helped her break free from her cage. She mustn't leave without a trace. The end of this world is approaching. This we cannot change. However, we will leave a hidden path behind. A path to the Latari. But it is not your path, human named Bronte. You are too tightly bound to your city, your goals, and your gods. You will never see us again, but we will remember you always, Niklaus Bronte. The creature floats away, turns a corner, and is gone. But some tiny part of the woman you loved will remain in this world. You linger there for a time, staring at the empty streets. Then you shake your head and return to reality. Elborn, the prefecture. You need to hurry. Oh. Octavia departed from this world, but left the teachings of the Latari behind. Oh, she's going to get a happy ending. Because the last few times, not been so good for her. Yeah, I'm going to see if, how far I can go without actually choosing a side in the rebellion. So we've gone to the prefecture, and the judges are all kind of up in arms because they want Elborn to make a decision on what's happening, whether he's going to side with the Empire or the rebellion. If I await his decision, then the revolt goes up. My willpower doesn't go anywhere because it's maxed out. But I still don't choose a side in the rebellion, which is interesting. <laughs> you look away from Elborn. The decision falls on the prefect and the rest of the judges. You are staying out of this. The judges and the prefect are just going round in circles. They make the same arguments over and over again. Even the stateliest judges are shouting now. Finally, Elborn loses his patience and pounds the top of the podium with his fist. I am still the Prefect of Magra. The gendarmes will not attack the people. This is my final decision. Now please, good judges, quit your bickering and do your jobs. The courtroom falls silence. Elborn, Elborn, you have the power to uphold law and order in Anazots, but you're afraid of your own power. You're afraid to give a single, simple order. You are a coward. Elborn's face grows red. He leaps from behind the podium. Captain Linard suddenly barges into the courtroom. The sound of screams and clattering hooves fill the room. The riders are coming. It's Austin and he's no more militia. Well, I'm still sitting on the fence. So with the arrival of Dorius Austin to the prefecture, I am going to continue my 
reign of sitting on the fence, I'm going to stay out of it, which we've done before. Where basically Otten ch uh, challenges Elborn to a duel, and we all know how Otten is with dueling. He is very proficient at stabbing people to death, and that's precisely what he does to Elborn. But it's not my problem, it's not my revolt, it's not my empire. Oh. I already know how this is going to end, it's going to be like, stay out of it, stay out of it, stay out of it, stay out of it, die. That's almost certainly how this is going. The March of the New Faith, I'm going to, once again, stay out of it. So they fight, the gods get real mad, they create an earthquake, it crashes the temple down and everyone dies. Well, Jen technically doesn't die, she's just buried alive. Which is, you know, arguably worse. The rebel leader, so in the main city square, Sophia's about to emerge as the leader of the revolt officially and rile up all the people, so I'm not going to get involved. Shockingly. Half and home, so the family are probably about to die. Okay, no, this is fine. Um, so I am going to get involved a little bit, but not siding with the rebellion or the empire. I'm just going to do what we did in the last playthrough, so fight for the fight for your home. I team up with Stefan and Father. We go out, we do some fighting, and Stefan stabs the ringleader in the throat, and then they all disperse. But the family is safe now, so that's good. There we are, the battle for Anazot, and I have yet to take a side. So Sophia's clearly had enough of my inability to decide where I sit in this, so she's we've come face to face, which is, funnily enough, this is the exact same setup we had for going into the last straw playthrough, which, at which point I think took charge of the blood bar. Yeah, because we got the Amazon Massacre. Um, so I can either flee, which I leave and live, and then the Amazon Massacre happens, or I defy Sophia and I die, and the Amazon Massacre happens. So, <laughs> either way, lots of people are going to die. Well, for the sake of doing something we've never done before, let's defy Sophia. You refuse to destroy your own city. In despair, you appeal to the crowd, asking them to renounce Sophia and stop the carnage. This is not going to end well. Obviously, because I die. As if oblivious to Sophia's orders, you look around you, paralysed. Fires have blanketed Anazots in acrid smoke. The noble districts are in flames, as is the Chancellery. The temples of the Old Faith are ablaze. The priests who refused to join the rebels are burned alive within. The bodies of those executed by firing squads lay in heaps by the wall. The cobblestones are littered with the corpses of those hurled from the windows of their own homes. What has become of your city? You turn your head slowly and meet Sophia's gaze. You will not perpetuate this madness. In despair, you address the crowd. Is this really what they want? Fire, blood, and murder? They've overthrown the nobles who rule over them. But who have they chosen to take their place? Sophia will only lead them to eternal bloodshed and endless suffering. They have not gathered here to revel in revenge and destruction. For the first time in history, they are in a position to lay the foundation for a new world. They have a chance to bring justice to everyone, to establish equality among the estates, to free themselves from the lots. Your voice hoarse, you finish your speech, utterly exhausted by the effort. The crowd is silent. Even Sophia is bewildered by your passionate plea. For a moment, you see the frightened girl who once lived next door to you, but the leader of the revolt swiftly regains her composure. Bronte's a traitor. Get him. The crowd bellows, traitor! Imperial lapdog! Strong arms grab you. You're surrounded by a horde of furious, blood-splattered last straw fighters. You're finished, Bronte. Execute him. Quick, put him on trial. At Sophia's order, you're forced to your knees. The crowd cheers in bloodthirsty anticipation, eager for another execution. The gunmen raise their muskets. People of Anazots, this is Nicholas Bronte, another enemy of our freedom. You know him as a comrade who fought by your side, but now, at the moment of truth, he faltered and betrayed us. What is your verdict? True death. You think back on the years gone by, all the difficult decisions you had to make, all the actions that led you to this moment. Your destiny has been fulfilled. Could you have chosen differently? Fire. A thunderous volley of gunshots rings in your ears. You head towards a blinding light. Oh dear. That's what trying to take a neutral standpoint gets you. Fire and blood engulfed the streets of Anizote before spreading to the rest of the Empire. Outcome of the Revolts. It only took a few days for the entire Empire to learn of the revolt and the events that had transpired in Anazot. 
the unthinkable victory of the common folk over the war engine that was the Imperial Legion, the ruthless and fearsome leaders of the rebellion, the terrifying slaughter of the nobles, priests, and anyone else who stood in the insurgents' way. By the end of the second day, the revolt had reduced the city of Anazot to a charred, smouldering ruin. Thick, acrid smoke from burning buildings and gunpowder blanketed the city. Bodies swung from ropes on every street. The results of the justice of the people's courts, sprawl, abandoned, lead-riddled corpses, could be found in every square. The events of those days enter the annals of history as the Great Anazot Massacre. But the rebels were not content. Having purged all their enemies from Anazots, they immediately began to march across the province. Every town and village in their way was freed from the noble rule. As the landowners fled in terror, the commoners abandoned their homes and armed themselves to fight beneath the banner of the Last Straw. The rebel army grew larger and stronger by the day. So began the bloody campaign of destruction. Wherever the rebels march, the old ways of the Empire collapse. They have no mercy, leaving nothing behind but smouldering ruins and the ashes of the dead. Age-old traditions burn as their ravenous flames consume town after town, city after city. The old noble dynasties are amassing their own armies beneath the banner of the Tempests to fight off this chaos. But the rebel hordes are already approaching the capital. There's no stopping them. Sophia's dream of waging war against the old world has begun. Regardless of the outcome, the Empire will never be the same again. But at least I'm not responsible for the massacre this time, that's something I guess. Power. The common estate achieved its goal and won its rights to freedom. Liberated from the noble yoke, the people of Anazot became a force to be reckoned with. The old restrictions imposed on industrialists and merchants of the common lot were lifted. The lands and estates of the noble families that fled the city were seized. Now the citizens had to learn to govern the city and manage their lives all on their own. The coming war doesn't frighten the people of Anazot. They're already rallying other cities in the province to their cause. They will not surrender their hard-earned freedom without a fight. Church. The new faith endured the persecution of the Inquisition and survived Patriarch Cassius to become the dominant church in Magra. Since then, most Magran priests preach that everyone is free to find their own path to the twins. The old faith has lost the influence it once had. It survives only thanks to the most uncompromising priests, the dynasties of old, and fearful commoners in the most remote Magran villages. Wealth. The crisis of the past few years have annihilated the province's former prosperity. The fertile fields have been scorched, the mines have been abandoned, the factories stand idle with no one to work in them. The looming threat of hunger and poverty drives the people to backbreaking labour and the tried and true ways of their ancestors. Commoners flee the cities in droves and flock to villages and towns, hoping to squeeze some paltry nourishment from the inhospitable Magran soil. The province is on the verge of starvation and turmoil. Order. Lawless anarchy replaced the old order, plunging Margaret into chaos. The people of the province no longer know whose order and which laws they are to follow, and the authorities that remain have no power to maintain order. The most reckless commoners become outlaws and thieves. The nobles feud amongst themselves. Bloodshed, looting, and wanton cruelty become commonplace in Magra, and this lawlessness soon spreads to the rest of the Empire. Divine Omens. So that's going to be the Elder came down and no one would speak to him. Because I was already dead by the time he came down. What became of Octavia? The creature that was once Octavia Melanidas left this world forever, but it honoured your request and left something behind. Years later, new followers of the Lotari began to emerge throughout the Empire, forming new circles in which to study their strange teachings and seek a way out of the world the twins had created. One by one, they discovered scraps of knowledge scattered across the Empire, but only you knew where this knowledge had originated. Despite the persecution they suffer throughout the Empire, the followers of the Lotari refuse to abandon their teachings. The Lotari have returned to this world. Nice. I'm happy about that. What became of Sophia? Ever since she was young, Sophia had been the living embodiment of hatred, the spawn of every hideous injustice committed by the Empire. She prevailed in struggle for Anazots, and that victory finally revealed her true power. Now Sophia casts her shadow over every corner of the Empire her eyes blazing with yellow flame, eager to incinerate every army and province in her path. No one can stop Sophia and defeat her bloodthirsty hordes. After the victory in Amazots, the inveterate rebel began a brutal war against the Old Order, a war that had seemed utterly unthinkable just a few years ago. A war of annihilation. Sophia is remembered as the woman who destroyed the Blessed Arcanian Empire and burned the Old World to the ground. The Brontes. 
You defended your home from a gang of thugs, but nothing could protect your family from the doom that awaited them soon after. When the massacre began, every single member of the Bronte family was murdered. The Brontes never sided with the rebellion, and they paid a terrible price for it. The Bronte estate was razed to the ground. All who lived within its walls are dead, murdered by the ruthless mob and condemned by the people's courts. Even the family crypt was desecrated and destroyed. Committing blasphemy and defiling the final resting place of the dead meant nothing to the crazed looters. The ignoble fate of the Bronte family became a tragic tale told among the people for years to come. Yeesh. Robert. Your father fought to his last breath to protect his home against a horde of Sophia's bloodthirsty followers in what came to be known as the Anazot Massacre. But in the end, he suffered the same fate as all the other enemies of the revolt. In accordance with the verdict of the People's Court, Robert Bronte was torn apart by the rabid mob. Eesh. Stefan. When the fateful day came, Stefan fought for dear life side by side with your father, just as any true nobleman would have. But his courage and valour were not enough to best a bloodthirsty mob. They mercilessly executed him after murdering your father. Oh good god. Gloria. Bronte family managed to marry Gloria off to Sir El Pelletier. When the family collapsed, the news hit her heart. Her last connection to her old life now lost to oblivion. Gloria's melancholy grew darker and deeper. Soon after, Gloria El Pelletier wrote her last poem. My god, you're tired, ill and sore, or ruthless, either or. When you rose higher to create the world, you cursed us all forevermore. An ashen skeleton was all you bore. My voice now gone, I try so hard to shriek. My freedom stripped by fishing nets you've cast. Against their stubborn threads I am too weak. My purpose lost, about to breathe my last. I'm done with this, my god, I've got no more to lose. The net is torn, the rusted bars are cracked. I won't forgive. For me, there's no excuse. You wanted this to end, now comes my final act. Oh, Gloria! Oh my god, Nathan. Nathan accepted his death at the hands of the frenzied mob. He did not resist. The realisation that the world had nothing to offer him but suffering killed your younger brother's spirit long before his final death. He departed to the twins to face the ultimate punishment for all the sins he had committed. Oh no. And me, I mean, I know what happened to me. I was killed. You've made your last and most important choice. Was your death worth it? Could you have chosen a different path? Either way, there's no going back. Your fate is sealed. There's no returning from the hereafter. And so you bid farewell to your mortal life. Everything you fought for, everything you strove for, all that is behind you now. You're on your way to the Shining Pillar to await the judgement of the Twins. You can no longer change the world's destiny, but the choices you've made and the deeds you did have left an indelible mark. The world will remember the life and suffering of Nicolaus Bronte. <laughs> I think, I think I'm going to the peak. Yeah, I think I'll send myself to the peak this time. Now end my life. Another episode pretty successful. So I set out with three things in mind, and again I have succeeded all three things. Which is even nicer considering the third thing, which is the Latari, was a nice to have. So the Court of Honor is dead, the rebels have taken over, Latari are back. Which means we now have 75% of the achievements, so 22 left to get. Uh, I need to have a little think on what I'm going to do next because what I think I want to do is try and I want to try and clear off the noble path. Once I've got all of the achievements there, we'll move back to either. I think we'll move back to Priest after that because there's still a few more things I need to tick off there and then we'll end up on Last Straw again because there's quite a lot I haven't done on that. So we'll finish off this one which I think one of the only things we've got left to do on this is to become the rightful heir of the family which is going to be tricky because I'm going to need to keep reputation and unity high enough but still kill Stefan in a duel but I need to build it in a way that because that knocks down my unity by quite a lot. So I need to go through the game with quite high unity so I can actually afford to do that when the time comes. Because I need to kill him and still become a noble to be able to do that. So that one's going to be tricky. I think I'm going to have to start the game right from childhood for that one. Which is going to be a bit of a chore, but it'll be worth it. So until then, if you want to check this out for yourself, then the link to the game page is in the description. If there's anything in particular you want to see or you think I've forgotten, then let me know. Leave me a comment. Thank you very much for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, then why don't you go ahead and... <laughs>
the like button. The old faith reborn that is the subscribe button. Make sure you that bad boy. And until next time, love you back.